Namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Today we're going to talk about realization, and it's a very nice verse. How is it possible to know or to meditate upon the Lord by the mind, except by turning the mind inwards towards the feeling I am, and thereby sinking it in the Lord who shines within that mind as its substratum, giving the light of consciousness to the mind which sees everything other than itself. Consider thus. So the problem of self-realization is not exactly with the self. The self is open on all sides. There's no boundaries, no gate, no fence. <laughs> but we are closed. We have put up walls. We have created boundaries. So this is myself and everything else is something other. Because we want to be an individual, we want to have our identity. So to break through these walls, these self-created boundaries, isn't easy. We have a fear that if we do that, if we actually uh, merge with the self, that we'll lose ourselves. <laughs> Completely wrong. But I remember, that's how it felt. And what's actually happening is that we're gaining our real self, which is everything. So we're not losing anything. We're, we're only losing something that never really existed in the first place. This illusory individual I, the ego. So how does it work? Ramana says... Turning the mind inwards. Uh, there are thousands of techniques of meditation, and they all use the mind, and they all turn it inwards. And usually at first, the mind is uh, concentrated on something other than the self. In other words, there's like a decoy. Some use the inner sounds or the inner lights. Some use a, a thought or a mantra. Some use a, a form of God or something else. But all meditation techniques try to turn the mind within. And why is that? <laughs> because when our mind is compulsively extroverted, through the senses, then in every moment it's being deluged with sense impressions. And these sense impressions distract us from who we really are, what we really are, which is nothing but consciousness. So when we have consciousness of something, especially consciousness of the senses, we tend to lose consciousness of ourselves and ultimately of the self because we get all caught up in what's outside. Now school and society, media, work, family life and so many other things try to make us extroverted, try to keep our attention going outward the opposite of meditation. So when someone first begins to meditate, they feel this tremendous resistance. This is like going against everything. Huh? It's like the ultimate revolution, the ultimate rebellion against the order of the world. Because the world tries to keep us distracted. It tries to keep us extroverted and... Uh, engaged in things outside. So there are many 
ways to counteract this, thousands of techniques. I mean, in Bhairav Vigyan Tantra alone, there are 112 techniques. The Buddha taught 84,000 Dharma doors. Huh? Well, what does that mean? That means that any experience, any perception can be used as a fulcrum to turn the mind within. I'll give some famous examples. Janaka, the father of Lord Ram, was a great king. He attained self-realization in his harem, surrounded by beautiful women. <laughs> and of course, there's a whole science of Tantra based on that. But most of it is quite misguided and usually has the opposite effect of making someone more attached to the senses. But we want to get less attached. In yoga, after asana, the next stage is pranayama, control of the breath. Well, what does it mean to control the breath? Most of the breath control taught as part of yoga leads to powers, extraordinary strength, or some mystic powers or something like that. And so it doesn't really help us go within. There is one exercise with the breath, however, which is called anapanasati. Again, comes from the Buddha, and this is what the Buddha himself used to attain enlightenment, which is simply watching the breath. Now, at first, when you watch the breath, there is going to be some interference. One will try to control the breath, uh, just out of habit. But normally, we don't control the breath, and nothing much happens. I mean, during sleep, we're completely unaware of breathing, yet breathing goes on somehow or other. So the actual idea and goal in Anapanasati is to allow the breath to breathe on its own, just like during sleep. So basically what we do in Anapanasati is watch the breath and allow it to subside naturally. It means we don't try to hold the breath in or out, but just let it go, not put any effort into it at all, and watch, be aware. The combination of these things leads to a, a state called waking sleep, where the body is asleep, but the consciousness is awake and aware. This is a beautiful state. I've been talking the last few episodes about the interval between dreaming and waking. Dreaming sleep and waking sleep. <laughs> Sleeping dream and waking dream. <laughs> and uh, how that leads to awareness of the substrate, as Ramana talks here. The mind, when turned inwards toward the feeling, I am, begins to cognize consciousness itself. And I discovered this back in, what was it, 2005, uh, sitting in a park in Mexico City and thinking, you know, this consciousness really is a wonderful thing. How is it? that we can be aware of this material world when we are actually pure spirit. And I was just contemplating this and, and looking at consciousness and turning it over in my mind. And in the process, I noticed I was feeling very blissful, that this was really wonderful. And unfortunately, at the time, I didn't have much knowledge of Advaita, so I didn't give it much significance. But actually, I had discovered this method of Atma Vichara that's given by Ramana. And this is the most wonderful thing, huh? to focus on this feeling, I am, not the words, I am. But there's a particular sensation in the mind, huh? right in the center of the head, that I am. 
and it's intimately connected with consciousness, with awareness. So somehow or other, <laughs> to counteract the compulsive extroversion to the senses, one of the best methods, it seems to me, from my experience, is right after the satisfaction of a big desire. Sex desire, for example. Right after a very uh, satisfying sex experience. To turn the mind inwards and look at this I am, this consciousness. Or, in the second chakra, after a feeling of tremendous energy, huh? then relaxing afterwards, look inwards. Or a beautiful experience of movement, dance maybe, or running, uh, then sit. After Qigong exercises, our teacher always had us sit and look within. She didn't explain any technique. <laughs> but, you know, if you just sit without any plan for long enough, things will start to happen by themselves. I'm talking about four, five, eight, ten hours a day. Just sitting. No plan, no technique, no nothing. Just sit. See what happens. Or... After a beautiful emotional experience, huh? if emotions are your thing, and after a very satisfying experience, maybe playing music or doing some other artistic activity or in love or some whatever emotion is most satisfying to you, after that experience, then sit down quietly and look within. Who is having this experience? I. I am. See, or after a very beautiful experience of communication, uh, being able to really speak your heart or your mind and really express yourself. And oh, it's so satisfying. And then, then sit down and simply contemplate who is speaking? Who is communicating? Where is this coming from? Who am I? Or if you like thinking, <laughs> after thinking or coming to a very satisfying conclusion of thought, stop and focus inwards on who is thinking, who is reasoning, who is coming to these wonderful conclusions. Or finally, in the seventh chakra, just bliss out. <laughs> I did this last night. Last night, I just, it was Friday night. I said, I'm going to party. <laughs> so I laid down so I could completely relax my body, forget all about it. And I simply went up into the seventh chakra, the thousand petal lotus, huh? Sahasrara, which is nothing but light and ecstasy of consciousness. And I just dove in. <laughs> you know, when I used to live on Guam, Guam has a, a beautiful lagoon, a saltwater lagoon, inside the reef with millions of fish. It's where all the fish go to breed. So there's every kind of fish, every kind of sea life in there. I used to go there and just swim for hours. I had, you know, snorkel and mask and flippers. I would just go in there. It was a couple of miles long and wide. And I would just splash around to my heart's content. So this felt the same way. Going into this ocean of light. Huh? And just jumping in and splashing around and having a great old time in this ocean of bliss. <laughs> so, of course, you lose yourself. You're not conscious anymore of I am but you're conscious of consciousness. You're conscious of the self. I, I. No more I am. Because the self is sufficient unto itself. So this is the way 
I use. This is a method I use, but it may not be suitable for beginners. <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> no, actually, there is no danger in meditation. There's no downside to it. If you're afraid of losing the ego, it's only because you think it's real, but it's not. It's an illusion that you create. So the mind sees everything other than itself. It's extroverted. In meditation, we're introverted and we see nothing but the self. That is real self-realization. Om Tat Sat Om Harihi Om